Hi guys, this video is about adductor tendinopathy and I'll ultimately show you how to treat it but I first want to um, discuss a bit about the anatomy and how it's caused as well so that you can understand why the treatment will work. So we're going to look at the anatomy, what it feels like when you've got an adductor tendinopathy because there are other things that can feel similar. We're going to look at the mechanism of injury, other conditions that can feel similar like I said, um, and then the treatment, and specifically for treatment, we're going to look at rehabilitation exercises. I'm also going to show you three exercises that you need to be really careful of. Um, and then running style adaptations that can help to offload your um, adductor tendons. And lastly, what other treatment options may be available if rehab and running adaptation doesn't work for you. My name is Mareka. I'm one of the physiotherapists from um, sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment for your injuries. So have a look at the description of this video. The link to our website is in there if you want to know more about that. Excellent. So let's dive into the anatomy first because there's something I want to show you about where the adductors are. So if you look at that video, um, <laughs> that picture, the adductors basically run on the inside of the thigh bone and they all come and attach over the pubic symphysis or around the pubic area. So if I can show you on myself, that means that they run along this line. You've got quite a few different ones that attach at different levels there, but they all come onto this part of the pubic bone. So right in the middle is your pubic symphysis. You can feel it as a dip there. And then to the side, is your your pubic bone where the adductors attach and they even at, attach right into there and that's where you can feel a lot of your pain when you have adductor tendinopathy you can feel it right in there and referring to the back as well a bit but the thing i wanted to point out specifically is if you look at these slides can you notice so that's the pelvis and can you see the stomach muscles coming from the top your rectus abdominis and how they attach to the top end of your pubic bone there. So pubic bone is this bone that you can feel there. Stomach muscles come and attach into the top bit of it. Also, if you look at the picture at the bottom, can you see there's white stuff that kind of surround the stomach muscles? They've cut some of it away there to show you that um, better. And there's also white things that attaches the adductor muscles onto that pubic bone as well as the, the stomach muscles onto the pubic bone. So the white things that attach them to the pubic bones are their tendons, and that's where you get the tendinopathy in the adductors. The white stuff that surrounds the muscles is fascia, and we've got fascia around every single muscle fiber. We've also got fascia around bundles of muscle, muscle keeping them together, and then we've also got fascia around muscles as a whole. And then besides the fact that it surrounds a single muscle, it also groups some muscles together. So like for instance, the stomach muscles has several layers of fascia and they all interconnect with each other. And at this pubic symphysis, the fascia from the top comes and meets the fascia from the bottom. So the fascia from the stomach muscles comes and um, kind of meets the fascia from the adductors and they become a single structure to an extent. So any injury to the adductor muscles often causes injury to the um, to the abdominal muscles as well and vice versa and if you've got a strength deficit in the one it can cause issues in the other also because they run over the pubic symphysis any issues with the pubic symphysis or in either of those groups can affect the pubic symphysis or pubic symphysis affect them now this fascia crosses over there and the fascia from both sides come and attaches into each other so if left side is injured for long enough it will affect right side eventually and that's something that we do see with adductor tendinopathies. You may have the pain at the beginning on the one side, but it quite often switches over and also involves the other side um, later on. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, if we think of, if I can remember what the next slide is. Oh yes, what it feels like. So I'm going to get this slide back up so that we can think about what it feels like. So adductor tendinopathy is when the tendon that attaches to the bone there on the pubis um, becomes damaged and injured and that's where it creates most of its pain so you can get your pain deep in the groin you can get the pain actually referring up into the stomach muscles you can get the pain referring down um, sometimes if the little nerve is irritated as well but I'll talk more about that in a minute you can get 
a little bit of tingling and stuff as well you can get that all combined then the pain can cross over to the other side and feel it in the middle as well a bit um, but the pain is very much located around that area Adductor tendinopathy often also, you can get it in isolation, but more often than not, it is seen with, together with a condition like osteitis pubis or um, abdominal tendinopathies. And I've made a whole video about osteitis pubis. If you want to know more about that, I'll link to that in the description of this video as well as at the end of it. Um, if I remember, there may be a link popping up now that takes you to the osteitis pubis video as well. Um, Okay, so that's basically where you feel your pain. The things that can be quite painful, let me just get my notes here because I'm always worried that I'm going to forget stuff and then I'm going to kick myself by the end of the video. Okay, so pain in the groin, abdominal. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Then mechanism of injury. The mechanism of injury is basically that it's an overload injury and it can be chronic overload or it can be acute overload so what do we mean with chronic overload chronic overload is when those tendons have to work really hard and they don't get enough time to recover between exercise bouts so remember whenever you do exercise you first get some micro damage in the, in the tendons muscles bones everything that's normal that's how we grow stronger your body then repairs it and you're ready for the next session. But if you can, if you continue to train really hard sessions too often and work that structure really hard, it may not get enough time to recover between your exercise bouts. And that's when the damage accumulates and can cause an injury like a tendinopathy. But you can also strain those tendons through an acute overload. Say for instance, your tendons are strong enough to deal with an hour's running in the mountains. And then suddenly you decide, well, I fancy doing a marathon in the mountains. So there's lo lots of downhill running, um, loads more than what it's used to. And that can cause a massive overload of that tendon and cause an acute tendinopathy for you. So typically for runners, it's if they do a lot of downhill running, that can cause a lot of over um, overload onto the tendon. It's also if you run with poor mechanics. So say for instance, you've got um, poor stability in your hips and your glutes are rather weak then that can mean that the adduct is overstrained it can be if you've got a muscle um, issue with your abdominals that they don't work as strongly as they should that the adduct is going to overstrain so biomechanics when you're running is quite important but then certain sports like for instance um, if you're doing a sport where like football where there's a lot of twisting a lot of accelerations decelerations those are all actions that really work the adductors really hard. And that's why footballers are quite prone to this type of injury as well. Um, so that is how you tend to get or the mechanism of injury. Now, other conditions that can feel very similar is I've already spoken about abdominal tendon tendinopathy. So actually a tendinopathy in that tendon where the abdominals come and attach to the pubic bone. That pain is often more towards the top of the pubic bone, but it can refer into the groin as well. It's also common that you can have both of these conditions together. Osteitis pubis, major one that can feel like that as well. Osteitis pubis is where you get the, um, remember where the pubic bones come together, you've got a little disc of cartilage, and it's where you get a lot of strain on that joint in the middle of the pubis there. And it's often um, accompanied by adductor tendinopathy as well as um, abdominal tendinopathy. You can get stress structures of the pubic bones that can be in the same area and give very similar pain to that. So, but how you distinguish between the two is through the history of how it's developed, through how the pain acts when you, um, when you exercise or when you're at rest. And a physiotherapist should be able to help you distinguish between the two through a careful interview with you and getting you to do some test movements and things as well. But if there's any doubt or there's a high suspicion of a stress fracture, it's best to get some imaging. Now, stress reactions in bone don't always show on x-rays, so an MRI scan is really the best way to, to differentiate between the two. 
Okay, so then what else? Sports hernia, so where you've got a, a tear of the inguinal ligament, anything in that area can feel very similar. Again, it can be in combination with the adductor tendinopathy that you can have a sports hernia as well. Um, yes, and then you can get obturator nerve entrapment, which can cause pain in that area, but actually it's the little nerve that's being squeezed. So if you're getting any pins and needles, funny sensations, numbness in this area or down the leg, it's worth um, consulting a physio about that because it may actually be that it's it's not the adductor tendinopathy and if you're going to go and strengthen the adductors severely you can make the entrapment worse so there's your treatment program has to be a, tweaked a little bit differently for that okay recovery times don't have that on that list but luckily I put it here if it is an adductor tendinopathy and it's a plain adductor tendinopathy without osteitis pubis and everything else that goes with it you're looking at at least three months recovery and then that will get you to about 90-95% better and then you're going to have to really work for several more months to get it to full capacity. If however you've neglected it for quite a while and you've got osteitis pubis and everything that plays into that, I find recovery times are usually six months or longer. So it all depends on how quickly you identify it, how quickly you react to it and getting the right treatment and the right rehab advice um, quite soon. Good, so treatment advice. The first important thing with treatment is I always start with activities you do in daily living. I so often come across certain things that people do in the day that just keeps those adductor tenders painful. And it's not because it's causing damage, but it's more, it's irritating it constantly like pressing on a bruise. One of the things that I should have said under what adductor tendinopathy can feel like is it can hurt quite a lot if you cross your legs. So for instance, if you're sitting cross-legged like I'm sitting now, which is not that great. So if you sit like this, that can cause pain in the groin. Or if you're sleeping at night, and especially when that injured leg is on top and it drops down, that can cause pain in the groin. Um, or if you sit in a really, in a squishy chair or with your knees slightly higher than your pelvis, that can often cause pain in the groin. And I think what happens is that because the bones move closer together, there's less space for the tendons and the, the bursa and the muscles and things that's in that corner. And because the tendons are so sensitive, that pressure is just enough to kick it off. I often see dramatic changes in my patient, patient's day-to-day -day pain levels, if they can just stop themselves from crossing their legs, from sitting in, the, in those surfaces, taking the, that compression component uh, out of their day, it can really, really bring your pain levels down to a much lower level throughout the day. So if you're a leg crosser, stop crossing your legs. It can make a big difference. And I'm going to talk more about that issue as well when we get to the rehab exercises in a minute. Then you may see that... On the internet, they, they tell you about adductor tendinopathy being caused by really, really tight adductors and tight structures around the hips. Yes, technically, I guess that could cause it, and you'll, you'll see it mentioned here and there. In my experience, most often that's not the main cause. Most often it's an overuse injury and that you've got muscle imbalances in other places. And you will find if you do adductor stretches, especially during the early stages, you often just flare the pain up because tendons that's irritated do not like being stretched. So if you're doing adductor stretches and your pain's just not getting better, stop doing them because they're likely making it worse, even if you don't feel it at that moment. It's okay to add them in towards the later stages of your rehab where the tendons calm down a little bit more if you need them, but it's not something that I routinely get my patients to do. Um, okay, so that's those things. Then, Something else in day-to-day -day life, if you think of the adductors work quite hard in any position where you're on a single leg especially, it helps to stabilize the leg. So if you're going to step down from high heights um, suddenly or jump off stuff or just play with the kids or with the dog or something in the garden, all of those things may just be a bit too high load if your tendon is really irritated. So watch what you do during the day that you don't do your rehab perfectly, but then go and annoy it because you're doing things in day-to-day -day life that the tendon is just not happy with. Good. Um, now, 
as with most rehab programs, actually all rehab programs, load management is the first important step of your rehab. And what I mean with load management is that you have got to establish what type of load this tendon can, can take throughout the day with all your activities that does not take it above the capacity that it can cope with. So as soon as you have an injury to your tendon, it loses some of its strength. So it won't be able to do all the stuff you were able to do before you injured it. And when we think of load management, we don't just think of your sport. So yes, fine, you may not be able to run at this point, but going for very long walks or walks on really uneven terrain um, or jumping rope, things like that can also overload the tendon at this point. So it's not just about running that you've got to think or about football, or about whatever your sport is. You've got to think of your day-to-day -day life as well. Now, there's no use in just resting it because plain rest does not let anything get better. It's much better if you can establish a baseline of activity that you can do that doesn't flare it up. Now, for some runners, that may mean that they have to stop running altogether for a period of time. And to be honest, in most cases for adult tendinopathy, I do find that you need a bit of a break from running. But it doesn't mean that you can't cycle. You can usually still walk as well for exercise. Often the guys can do cross training or they can go swimming with it. Um, and if kicking annoys it, you just put a pool boy between your legs. Um, so be innovative, test different things and think about what things are more likely to irritate it than others. OK, so you've figured out your load management. Then we've got to think about strength training exercises so that we can strengthen the tendon back up. I first want to talk about three exercises I want you to be really careful with. And the reason I'm highlighting these is because they are exercises that are often prescribed during the initial stage of injury. And it just makes people worse. So let me get them up here. Um, where are my exercises? There they are. Okay, so let's start from top to bottom. The first exercise on there, where the guy's lying on his side, lifting his leg up. I don't understand why people give this exercise to patients, because it's, in my books, a pretty useless exercise, especially if you've got a high hamstring tendinopathy. And I'll explain to you why. Remember how I said hamstring tendons do not like being compressed in the groin when they're injured. Now look at that position. That guy is forcing that leg as high as it can off the floor into that compressed position. So he's pushing on the bruise. He's just going to make his pain worse. Second, he's taking the leg into a position that's really not functional. Now, I'm not on about all exercises have to be functional, but that is not a position that's useful for any sport. In fact, we want to try and avoid people over adducting their legs when they're running or when they're doing sport. Second, it's an extremely low load exercise. Even if we think of isometrics for pain management, it's got to be isometrics with some weight or resistance behind that. And that is just not doing anything really. So I really want to plead with therapists, just don't give that exercise to patients. I've seen so many people come to me saying, I can't do exercise because what the physio gave me just made me worse. And then this thing is on the list. And as soon as we take it off and they don't do it for a week or two, they're as happy as anything because their pain levels have dropped. And it's not because I've given them brilliant exercises. I've just told them to take the compression component out of it. So avoid that exercise, especially in the first stages of your, of your injury. Now, the second one is a useful exercise, but I just want to point some things out there. I often also get people who make themselves worse through that exercise. And it's because they've, been they've, they've not actually been told to do it in a way that's less likely to irritate them. It is an exercise that you'll even see in the research is included in rehab programs, but it's often with something like a football between the legs. Now, if you place a football between the legs, it means that the legs are, for most people, unless you've got really wide hips, a little bit adducted as well as externally rotated. So it's taken out of that compressed position. And then if you squeeze it, it's not gonna go into compression. So even with that ball that that guy's got between his legs, because it's such a squishy ball, it's likely going to take him into a compressed position and it will likely also annoy his tendons if they're really sensitive. The other point about this is do not the first few times that you do it, try to press as hard as you can. You've got to test it because it's not going to necessarily like being pressed 100% or tensioned those tendons 100%. So 
a better way of doing it would be place a football or something between your legs that keeps your legs separated that they don't go into the compressed position and then only press it about 60% of your maximum contraction first and hold it for whatever time you were told to hold it and relax and do that and check your 24 hour pain response and if it's no worse and or even feels a bit better then you know that's a safe level then you can press a tiny bit harder the next time but check the pain response and if you find a level that it doesn't like to go above just don't go above that work it at the level that it's happy so ball squeezes useful exercise um, but just if it's done right I don't actually give that one to my patients I tend to like to to use progressive planks rather than that and I'll explain to you how I use them in a minute Third exercise I want you to be careful of. Again, it can be a useful exercise if you do it in the right way or at the right time during the rehab. So what she's got there is it's adduction with a band. So you're pulling the band towards you. So you're isolating the adductor muscles. I find that in the acute stages where the adductor tendons are still really aggravated, it's better not to choose exercises that really isolate the adductors. That's for later. It's better to work with global exercises that kind of works them, but they've got a bit of support from other muscles. And I'll go into detail about that in a minute. The other thing that she's doing there is, can you see that she's crossing her leg over? She's taking it into a compressed position. So it would be better if she just stopped at neutral and let it go out. Then it would be less likely to irritate her. Now, I'm not saying avoid that forever and that it's a bad exercise. If you're a footballer, you've got to be able to use your leg in that range. But it's something that I would put into your program maybe six to eight weeks after we start a treatment because it's something that we want to only do once the adductor tendon is ready to do it. For runners, I wouldn't bother going that far. I would just work to neutral with it. So if you look at that adduction with band exercise, I wouldn't do it in the first few weeks because often I find it just flares people up. I would use quite a low resistance to start with it and I wouldn't cross the legs over in the initial stages. The other thing that I have to say as well, when you do do that exercise, it's actually a brilliant one if you do them right at the right stage, is the leg that's supporting you, the adductors in that leg has to work really hard as well, but in a supporting function. So make sure when you do add this exercise in that you don't just do the pulling bit with the injured leg. You have to also pull with the other leg and stabilize on the injured leg. Then you really work both of the, um, the adductor in two ways. So first exercise, just ignore it. The other two useful, but do them at the right stage and in the correct way. Okay, so let's move on to general then exercise. You've got to think about the healing process in roughly three stages. So you, I'm not going to talk about what happens to the cells. I'm more going to talk about um, the pain levels and how sensitive your tendon is. So in the initial stages where the tendon is really sensitive and you can easily aggravate it, I tend to go for exercise that works global muscle groups. So remember, your adductors help with hip flexion. The posterior bit or the back part helps with leg extension. They work through squatty movements. They, they are active during deadlift type movements. So we can use all of those things to start strengthening them in positions where they don't have to work on their own. They've got support from other muscles, so it's easier for them to cope with it. So the first type of exercise I get my patients doing are just regular old front planks because you're tensioning them at the front, you're getting the stomach muscles working. Remember the stomach muscles crosses over into the adductor tendon, so we're tensioning all of that. And when my patients are really sensitive, I sometimes have to start them with things like hovers, where they're actually on all fours just lifting knees off instead of planks, or knee planks, and then front planks. And later stages will progress it to front planks lifting legs up if they're ready for the crossover forces to be increased. But at the beginning, double leg, just front planks. I'll also add in side planks if the leg will tolerate it, but I'll often place a cushion between the legs so we don't get that compression. And I'll start with side planks with their knees on the floor. And the reason I add these in is when you do a side plank, the leg at the top does isometric adduction into the leg at the bottom. 
And I have found that that works better for me than the ball squeezes because people don't tend to over squeeze it and irritate things. But remember that cushion between the legs. Then as soon as they can do it for 30 to 40 seconds, I move them on to straight leg side planks. Again, often still with the cushion between the legs, progressing to without the cushion between the legs. When they can do that, I move them on to adductor hangs, short levers, onto long levers off chairs. But I have to be honest, with that one, I choose my patient. So if it's an athletic person who does strength training quite often, I'll definitely add that in. If it's more one of my deconditioned runners that I often get, who's not used to strength training, that exercise is usually a bit overwhelming for their adductors. So I tend to not do hangs. I still do the side planks and stuff, but I don't progress it to the hangs off the, um, off the bed. I tend to add other things like the band exercise in then rather. Um, okay, so that's side planks. Then for the posterior function, so we've, we've now got an isometric double leg exercise for the front. That's the regular planks. We've got side planks that gets the adductors more. Then if we want to work the posterior part of the adductors more, bridges, brilliant. I love them. And I tend to, if the patient can tolerate them, I tend to go for high bridges. So with your feet on a chair, that you get more, that they're more hamstring dominant and work the adductors a bit more. Start with double leg ones. As soon as they, you feel it's stable enough, the tendon is okay with it, you start lifting one leg up, that we're getting a, a crossover force through everything and increasing the force. Um, so those would be typically my starting things. Also double leg squats. Um, at the beginning, just body weight. Later on, goblet type squats. I'll start with good morning type movements or deadlift, depending on what the patient can tolerate. But everything is double leg, everything is low load at the beginning to see what the the movements are and often they are isometrics. Now as the patient recovers and the tendon can start tolerating more load and becomes less sensitive, I then move on to single leg um, type exercises, but again quite stable at the beginning. So we're thinking single leg supported squats or split squats. We're thinking static lunges. Um, often lunges just forwards backwards at the beginning before we go sideways as well. Uh, what other things do we add in? At that stage, I may start doing light band work. We support it on that one leg, pulling the other one in and then crossing over as well. What else do I add in there? Have I written anything down? Um, yeah, so all of these things will, some exercises will be able to progress quite quickly, while others movements I'll be a lot more careful with and have to progress more slowly with. And then once they're happy with controlled single leg stuff and loading it quite heavy in those positions, I'll move on to more dynamic things. So fast lunges, lunges to the sides where the adductors have to work eccentrically, slides, so sliding sheets, or if you don't have a sliding sheet, tiled floor, towel on there, works brilliantly. Um, we'll start with some hops if it's appropriate for them and their sport and depending on the, um, on the level of my athlete that I'm working with, to be honest. Because I find for less conditioned runners who don't hop as a rule or don't have a lot of explosive force, I often find, yes, double leg plyometrics, but then getting them back to running works as a pretty good plyometric exercise for them. But most of the time, I'll use a combination of those type of things. So make sure you start with really stable things and progress them through slowly. What am I leaving out here? Um, yeah, so the later stage is absolutely isolate those adductors and work them hard, but be careful in the early stages. Now, then we get to running, I think. Let me just see if that's the next thing. Yes, okay, so running style. What the research is showing is you can strengthen muscles up as much as you want and have the strongest glutes ever, but if you are used to running with a certain pattern, having strong muscles won't necessarily make you run with a better pattern. So it's important to look at what your athletes are doing when they're moving as well. I'm gonna talk about runners specifically because that's the caseload that I work with most. So if we think of things in running style that can specifically affect your adductors and give you a tendinopathy or contribute to a tendinopathy, it's overstride is in there, of course, is the first, because overstride, when you land with your heel strike quite far in front of your body, it means your impact forces are quite large. And especially if we think of running downhill and things like that, um, if you really bang into it, that becomes even more of a problem. So getting them to land with a foot slightly more underneath them while leaning slightly 
not leaning forwards like bending, but just kind of whole body leaning forwards. That can be a way to reduce that. Also, if you're running with a narrow gait, see if you can just get the feet slightly that it's not as if you're running on a tightrope. Um, if, you, if you're quite a hard heel striker, see if you can maybe get yourself to just come a little bit more to the midfoot. So again, just getting those feet underneath you more when you land will already help with that. If, you, if your cadence is below 160, see if you can get it up to 165, 170 at least, because that will me, mean that your impact forces again is lower going through the leg. Um, what you also, if you've got a pelvic drop, when you look at yourself, if somebody films you from the back and you look at yourself running and you can see your pelvis does that when you run, you want to try and teach yourself to run with a pelvis that only drops slightly, so not that excessively. And also if you see your knees moving in quite excessively as you run, you want to think about running with knees that's pointing slightly further for, um, more forwards when you run and don't quite whack in so much. Um, an easy way to get things, these things, all of these components in there without really having to think about it is if you increase your cadence. That's one of the best ways to get that. Or think about running with soft feet or soft landing, because again, that's going to speed you up a little bit. But always start with first observing what you do, what you feel like when you run. And if you can, let somebody video you. Best done on the treadmill. It's a bit hard when somebody's running behind you with a with a um, camera, but you can still actually get a pretty good video from, from that. So see what you can do there. Now, for some people, even though they do everything absolutely by the book, um, their pain just continues. I will say that often I find it's because patients aren't quite patient enough with how long rehab takes. And I've gone through the same thing myself that I think, it's never going to get better, why is it still sore? And then I go and count on the calendar, I go, oh, it's only been six weeks. Okay, fine. Uh, it takes eight to 12 weeks for most serious injuries to go. So make sure that you mark on the calendar where you are in your recovery process and what the prediction was for when you will be back to full, uh, full strength. And as long as you can see that you can see progress week on week, then it means you're recovering and you likely don't need further intervention. But if you look at that and you look at your progress and you see that it's not just not progressing, it's just too painful, you can't get on with proper rehab, then there are other options that can help. So Shockwave can help with pain management that can allow you to do rehab. Um, there are injections that can be done like PRP and stuff like that. I have to be honest, I have not prepared any of that, so I don't know what the latest research is saying on those um, things for you. I haven't prepared it for this video because I wanted to talk about rehab more. But those are options. And if you, if you find you can't progress with your rehab, the best person to go and see is a sports physician because they are extremely good with diagnosing stuff. So they can have a good look at you and decide, is it just the adductor tendon? Is something else going on as well? And then they have the ability to offer you a variety of injections or shockwave or other treatments as well. So let me know if you've got any questions. If you need more help with your injury, you're always welcome to consult one of us via video call. Link to the website is in the description of this video. Take care.